the ILO's perspective. The institute where I work, much of the analysis is based on the World of Work Report, which is an annual publication looking at labor market and social issues. We also have a series of country studies, one of which was Tunisia, on growth with equity. And basically, how can we use equity to promote growth? It's kind of the starting point. And I think following up on the presentation, basically we had this question that, look, we've had this enormous amount of growth over the past two, three decades, particularly in Latin America and Asia, but also in OECD countries. And the question was, where did the money go? So we have this large amount of wealth that's been accumulating, and the question is, where has it been distributed to? With that in mind, I'm going to give maybe just a very quick introduction of recent trends in terms of income inequality. Most of you will be familiar with these trends, but also maybe more broadly from a macro perspective about between labor and capital, where has the money gone from a, a firm perspective, and what are some of these implications for shared society? On inequality, I will talk maybe very briefly on a few issues of why do we care, focusing perhaps on some of the economic issues, but noting, of course, that there are many, many reasons why we should care about income inequality. And finally, to conclude with some key policy considerations, which I think will overlap a little bit with the first presentation, but maybe add a little bit in terms of some of the policy trends as to what we've seen before the crisis, but also within the crisis, and to what extent that may have actually or could exacerbate some of the trends that we've seen up until now. I think on the first point, from a global genie perspective, if you will, we can see the breakdown for the world, advanced economies, emerging economies. We can see that between the 80s and the 1990s, inequality almost doubled, continuing through to the period before the crisis, again, almost tripling. Just to give you a sense that global inequality is rising and rising at a fast pace. Now, of course, there are some countries within this who have managed to reduce inequality, Brazil, in fact, being one of them. In fact, inequality in Brazil has been falling for about seven, eight years or more, although, as Juan notes, income inequality remains high. So there is some areas where income inequality is declining, but in general, we know that income inequality has been rising and for some time. The small caveat I would mention on this, of course, is that with the limited information we have for advanced economies, as we would expect, income inequality during the crisis is actually falling. So the nature of the crisis has basically destroyed a lot of wealth or income at the higher end. The question is, how long will this last? Theory will tell us that this will happen for a short period of time, but as we recover from the crisis, of course those vulnerable people who've been affected also by the crisis will have a tougher time recovering. And so then I'll come back to this in terms of the policy responses and how this may affect inequality going forward. In terms of inequality, just a very quick note, the figures are well known, I think, to most people, is that not only has the wealth or income been concentrated in a smaller group of people, but that group of people is actually particularly small, the 1%. And this, of course, has created the Occupy Wall Street movement. We are the 99% and has raised some considerable issues with respect to social cohesion. So in the case of South Africa, again, as Juan mentioned, the distribution um, is particularly skewed at the tail, if you will. One thing in thinking about the management, uh, the Maastricht School of Management in terms of inequality for certain workers, one thing I, I wanted to raise, and this was in our report two years ago, was in the US, the development of CEO pay vis-a-vis -vis other workers. And so the first panel you can see basically that the average growth rate of CEO pay was more or less 20 times that of the average worker, average employee in the US. And as a result, in panel B, you see that in 2007, before the crisis, the ratio of CEO pay to average worker was about 500 compared to 369 only four years before. Now, one thing I would also quickly mention here, in terms of the components of the CEO pay, 
there's been actually, during the period, the growth period, there was an increased concentration of stock options, which were, um, which you could option, if you will, in a very short period of time, which meant that the CEOs were very much driven by short-term uh, firm performance. And in fact, most of the analysis of CEO pay and firm performance shows that there is actually a D-link uh, grosso modo, between CEO pay and firm performance. And so the question is, you know, CEO of <coughs> Apple, the late Steve Jobs, of course, had probably the lowest salary, but yet you had very good firm performance. But in general, there seems to be a D-link between CEO pay and longer-term firm performance. It raises the question of pressures of financial markets, which I will come to in a minute. I mean, underlying this is a broader trend of a shift from labor to capital. So this is in our report of last year. We looked at the national accounts of quite a few countries. And between 2000 and 2009, roughly 83% of them showed an increase in the capital share of GDP, which means there's been an increased uh, reliance or shift of income towards capital away from labor. So not only has there been within labor a shift towards a smaller group of people, but more generally, all of the workers have been receiving less of the gains from growth. Also within firms, within advanced economies, we see that the profit shares of financial firms have been growing much faster than that of non-financial firms. One thing I, I found we were particularly surprised by, if you will, within this chart in advanced economies is that, of course, with the onset of the financial crisis, we see that the profit share or capital share of financial firms was dramatically hit in 2008, but perhaps not surprisingly, due to some of the stimulus or rescue measures, the profit share of the financial corporations in 2009 actually rebounded to more or less levels pre-crisis, yet the non-financial corporations have continued to decline. One thing to note, of course, is that financial corporations still in advanced economies account for a relatively small share of the overall pie of the profits. But the interesting point, and here I show emerging countries as well, is that what has this meant in terms of, um, in terms of two issues, I would say. One is sort of the type of investment, and two is the type of talent. And I think we've done a previous study showing that a significant share of MBAs, a disproportionate share, are moving towards financial firms because of the increased profit shares or talent or pay that's being offered by financial corporations. The second is what we see is because of these relatively large profit shares within financial firms, we see what we call a financialization of non-financial firms, which means that instead of investing in productive investment, if you will. What we've seen is non-financial firms investing in financial type operations. So you, before the crisis, you would see a GM, which would then create a financial arm, which would finance uh, the purchase of cars, etc. And this is something which is more or less widespread. So the type of investment has also shifted away from more traditional type productive investment to financial um, type assets. One thing I also wanted to pick up on, in particular in advanced economies, is the evolution of dividends. So one is, okay, there's been an enormous amount of profits going to firms as a share of total wealth. Much of that wealth has gone to financial firms. But also globally within advanced economies, apart from shifting resources to financial assets, an increasing share of gross operating surplus has been targeted towards dividends, so payouts um, in the form of dividends. And what we were most surprised by, again, was that during 2008 and 2009, dividend payments uh, more or less stayed the same as a share of gross operating surplus. Even dividends fell slower than gross operating surplus, in fact, which meant that despite falling profits following revenues, firms still paid dividends. Now, complementary to this was we did an analysis of dividend yield. 
which is more or less dividend to stock price. And counter to this, the dividend yield stayed the same or actually increased, which our interpretation is that there is pressure from financial markets to continue to pay dividends as a share of the stock price rather than as a share of firm performance, which again highlights the importance or increasing importance of the financialization of the system across all firms, not just financial firms. Why do we care about income inequality or shifts in wealth? This first chart from pre-crisis on the y-axis is household debt to GDP and Gini on the right. Some of you are probably familiar with this. I mean, it's a very crude analysis of what I call <coughs> keep, keeping up with the Jones. You know, economists like to say that some income inequality is a good thing. It incentivizes people to work harder. But the reality is that in advanced economies, this push down in wage shares, if you will, or income inequality has meant that individuals seek out debt to try to close this gap. Particularly in the US, this had implications for household purchases. Now, <clears throat> this is not to say that income inequality is the driver of the household bubble in the United States. I mean, there are a number of factors, including, of course, banks' easy supply of credit to households. There was the famous uh, ninja loans, which was no income, no job, but still you could get a mortgage. Uh, there's also lower or easy monetary policy. There's also a Bush domestic policy to push household ownership among low-income earners. I mean, there's a variety of factors. But the thing I want to illustrate with this chart is that it's important to note that individuals try to close the income gap with <coughs> debt, which can have severe consequences, uh, economic consequences, as we've seen. Another important consideration along the same lines is sort of global imbalances. And this has sort of been one of the key issues that have been discussed within the context of the curtain crisis. So on the one hand, in a number of advanced economies, you had excess demand for credit to close the gap, if you will, in terms of income inequality. But on the second hand, you had excess savings in a number of surplus countries. I mentioned emerging economies here, but also Germany being, of course, the elephant in the EU room, about uh, export-led growth. But the thing I want to highlight here is that this excess savings in some of the larger emerging economies is due also to precautionary savings, partly due to having experienced previous crises before, but also due to lower wage growth, in particular in relation to productivity, but also in the absence of, of social protection. And this has led to sort of an export-oriented model, which has meant that these excess savings, if you will, have not been channeled into social protection, into promoting domestic demand, but rather to facilitate, if you will, the credit to bubble in other instances. Again, not the only cause, but still an important consideration. One argument about capital shares is okay, but capital, rising capital shares, rising profit shares are great because it goes to investment and then it creates employment. But the reality is that investment in advanced economies has been meager or weak at best and hasn't grown in line with growing profit shares. There's a similar story in emerging economies, but to a lesser extent. So the, the point here is that investment, of course, has continued to grow significantly in a number of these economies, but haven't really grown as fast as the profit shares. One thing I would also note in the emerging economies, which stands in stark contrast to the advanced story, is that the dividend payouts within firms in the emerging economies has more or less stayed the same. So there's been an, a slight increase in the tendency to pay out dividends, but nowhere near the, the relationship we see in advanced economies. Coming back to some of the issues, the ILO, we've also done work on the, the global um, Gallup survey, 
And we basically, unlike OECD, we said, okay, we're going to do an index anyway. Uh, as dangerous as that may be, um, <clears throat> I think partly because of the issues Juan raised is that within the Gallup survey you have a plethora of questions which look at different issues. And it's, it's very difficult to really try to assess which is doing what. But still we thought, okay, we're going to take a series of questions and combine them to an index and see how they relate to some of the factors. I think what's interesting from the ILO perspective is that Growth seems to matter much less than employment and incomes in determining what we call social unrest or social cohesion, which I think has important consequences for what we've seen in terms of the Arab Spring and the crisis. Where do we go from here? I think the first point is less regressive tax systems. I mean, Juan mentioned, I think, very importantly, the role of tax and benefit systems in reducing inequality. But two things I'd like to note is that the tax system has been used counterproductively to now. So in the first instance, in advanced economies, the income tax rates of the top marginal tax rates have actually fallen. The second point is that during the crisis, with the fall in revenues and fiscal consolidation, basically a large set of countries have decided to move to VAT, which, as we know, is very regressive. So we have the tax system, very important, but all indicators point to the fact that, if anything, what we're going towards is a more regressive tax system. So, I mean, I think the, the main message here at the bottom is that we need a more balanced kind of tax or policy approach to rewarding work incentives. I mean, no one would disagree that we need to reward work incentives, even for the top income earners, but there needs to be some kind of balance uh, with that and revenue generation. I think second, of course, is again social protection. And this, of course, can help not only facilitate transition, it also helps, as Juan also mentioned, it brings people together, it makes them part of the decision-making process, it gives them a safety net. But the reality is that social transfers, again, have declined in most of the economies, with the few exceptions in Latin America. And second, we have about 20% of the world's population which doesn't have any social protection whatsoever. And finally, on unemployment benefit schemes, they're literally or non-existent in many of the major emerging economies. In Brazil, I mean, there's a very small scheme which covers roughly maybe 5% of employment. But these schemes actually cost something. But I think we would argue that these types of programs are not that expensive, certainly in relation to some of the costs that have been associated with trying to address this crisis. So the question is, how do you divert, or how do you target resources rather than where do the resources come from? I think it's just the question of making priorities and making tough decisions. Rewarding productivity. I mean, I think we would argue that wages need to grow in line with productivity, but this is not something just for workers, it's also something for management, it's something for CEOs. And there needs to be a more clear decision-making process of how we do that. It's not something that's easily done, it's not something that's done on a weekly basis, it's not something that's done on a monthly basis, but it's something that we should be working towards. And here, from an ILO perspective, the role of social dialogue, I think, is very important. Finally, encouraging real investment. Here we did a simulation basically within the advanced economy. We said, okay, look, all of this money that went to dividends, if we'd kept the dividend to profit ratio the same leading up to the crisis, we would have gotten another 1.6 million jobs in advanced economies alone. Which means paying out considerable amounts in dividends, but just keeping the share of profits the same. Another one simulation we did is, okay, in mean, advanced economies, if we'd kept investment growing at the same pace as GDP, we would have received another 6 million jobs. So the question is, can we, by promoting productive investment, by encouraging investment in what we call the real economy, not financial assets, we can have better uh, labor market and social outcomes. I mean, there's a number of ways to do that. We can target SMEs. There's tax credits for innovative firms. But there needs to be a, more of a recognition of how the financial system plays a strong role 
in influencing some of the behavior within the non-financial firm. And here on the previous slide, I mean, I mentioned the role of corporate governance, but this is a very tough issue. Should there be independent board members? Uh, I mean, it's a very, very tricky issue of how board of directors can better control CEO pay because there's a clearly an insider uh, conflict of interest to some extent. So just to conclude, uh, profits and dividends grew at the expense of income inequality. Income inequality was one of the key elements, if you will, of the crisis, but there are another, uh, a number of others. What worries me the most, I think, is that a number of policies that are being implemented in order to address the crisis may, in fact, exacerbate income inequality going forward. And I think hopefully during the course of the two days, we can show that income inequality is not only economically inefficient, but it's also socially untenable. Thank you.